All right, well, here we are for uh, the November taxi transmitter passenger profile. But oddly enough, this gentleman's no longer a passenger. He's a, an alumni, you will, of taxi high school or taxi <laughs> graduate school, I should say, Mr. Jan Barge. Welcome, Jan. Thank you so much. I'm excited to interview you because I remember when you were an active taxi member, but the thing that you might be most famous for to the membership body at large is the fact that you're from the Netherlands and you brought me a bottle of the Netherlands. Uh, I don't know if it's the most famous drink you guys have. Not but... at all. <laughs> <laughs> An obscure drink called yeah. Shelvis Peckle that I heard about right. on a TV show. And uh, Jan came to a road rally and brought a bottle all the way there. We were talking about it at this year's road rally, actually. Um, remember, uh, Ron Harris took a drink on the panel on the last panel. He did a shot and he never drinks and he got so drunk on the panel on one shot. So we were reminiscing and your name came up in the ballroom at the very end of the road rally. <laughs> well, next time I'll visit the road rally, I'll bring a full box. How about that? <laughs> Great. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll make it over there to see you uh, and we can go to a factory tour because it's really fascinating. One guy makes the label, makes the brew or distills it, does everything. Pretty fascinating, but not as fascinating as your career, which uh, I remember at the time when you were still a taxi member that things were happening, you know, things would take place for you. I'd hear, oh, Jan Bars collaborated on this, Jan Bars, uh, and do you pronounce the S? On the end of bars. Yeah, what, yeah sure. Okay. Bars. Uh, I got bars. <laughs> bars? <laughs> You've got bars. <laughs> uh, anyway, Jan was, you know, collaborating with this member, got a placement with that member, got a placement on his own. But I think it might have been EDM or K pop that all of a sudden you weren't just doing instrumental cues for TV, that you started getting more and more into stuff for records. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, definitely. And I'm definitely one of those members who started coming to Taxi thinking he could become a songwriter real quick. Yeah. Uh, it took a little longer than I expected, but eventually I got there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, um, so, yeah, so coming into Taxi, actually, I heard about Taxi from a gentleman uh, in uh, in Asia, British guy. Okay. And uh, keeping uh, it I inter international. <laughs> yeah. Um, I totally forgot his name, but he, he told me about taxi. I was skeptical, uh, and very broke. So I, uh, just couldn't af afford it at the time. But, uh, when I came back to the Netherlands, I started making music and I was like, okay, as soon as I got a couple of, uh, uh, demos, I'll just become a member and then check it out. And the cool thing about taxi at that time, I don't know if you still do that, is that you can check the briefs. So I knew what people were looking for. And it just tried to make that um, and uh, focused on quality, really. And uh, and then eventually I became a member and started doing uh, lots of uh, future bass at the time, future bass instrumentals. That's what it was. I knew yeah. it was something that I personally didn't know the genre very well and that you were becoming quite active and quite good at it. And Super uh, EDM-y, yeah. Yeah. And... Uh, so what happened because now i want to let you know that jan has uh he's like a big deal k-pop producer and uh making famous records and stuff working with famous acts uh, of course i don't have the bio up yeah here where is it uh got a lot of stuff between you and i <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's fine I, there's what i i want to mention to everybody by the way i just got back from a, a trip last night and i came back with covid so not only is jan the first alumni i'm interviewing he's the first one i've ever interviewed while sick on covid <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah anyway your multi-platinum producer uh songwriter and producer from the netherlands got to start as a taxi member uh, and became a hit maker for the asian market uh, he rates k-pop produces for dutch hip-hop acts and has millions of plays on spotify on his own piano instrumentals. I remember that you did piano instrumentals. 
Uh, he started his work on TV cues and K-pop while he was still a taxi member, learning from collaborations he did with members that he met on the taxi forum and at the road rally. How appropriate. <laughs> yeah, definitely at the rally as well. Yeah, but mostly on the uh, uh, just online because, you know, me being in the Netherlands, um, I was just working online a lot, yeah. definitely in the beginning. Um, so, yeah. Well, I, I mm -hmm. go ahead. I guess early on, one of the first uh, things I realized that I wasn't good enough uh, in is uh, just English. So writing good English lyrics. So that's one of the first people uh, I started looking for. Uh, and I found Lyrics Matter, who you might be familiar with um, on yeah. the taxi forum. So started doing some, uh, some songs with her. She's great. She can do any genre. Um, and then Terrell as well, Terrell Bird. Oh, I didn't uh, know you were working with Terrell. Uh, I, I yeah, just saw him at the rally, I think. Yeah, we have. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, probably, yeah. Yeah. And then before that, he was here in Italy uh, at a K pop camp, songwriting camp. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, and he's a rapper, obviously. So, you know, I just, I was just looking for people who could do uh, great lyrics and vocals i'm not a vocalist myself either so that's the first thing i started looking for and then uh being a taxi member you inevitably hear about you know instrumentals and so i started doing that as well and so, that's when i got my first placement so i guess it was around the end of the first year or the beginning of the second year or so that i got my first placements was this like in the around 2012 13 somewhere around there not or that later? long ago i think uh or maybe it is. Let me think. Maybe fourteen fifty. Okay. Yeah. And so you mentioned you weren't good enough, and that your English wasn't so good for writing lyrics. But um, I remember listening to your stuff because whenever you would get a place where you would hit my you know radar for something, I would go check out your music and go, "Wow, this guy's talented. He knows what he's doing." You were always good at building tracks. Um, how do you go at, at first you were a beat maker, if I remember correctly, and, um, well, you were making beats anyway, and, and, and trying to kind of adapt that into how can I make this work for instrumentals for TV yeah. and then, and then you went back to song rank. So how do you transition from being a beat maker to a producer? Is there a school, you know, like beat makers <laughs> sign up here? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like uh, a lot of people are, oh no, my computer wants to restart. One sec, no, cancel. I was just updating. Um, <laughs> but I feel like a lot of people around me, like producers who are actually beat makers are struggling with that, you know, uh, getting into becoming actually a producer or more of a songwriter slash beat maker. But, you know, being aware of the entire package and being part of the, of the full story uh the f yeah um and so for me I, I i beginning with taxi i wanted to make songs so i was always super interested in songs you know studied max martin um and songwriting in general so i did the instrumentals because i was like hey i guess i can do this and i can make some money with this and i can build some traction with this um and at the same time, I will still keep working on my songwriting skills and, uh, you know, try to do that as well. Um, and so for me, the most important step really was in the room collaboration. That was the most important thing, I think, that that changed in my career. So and this is a fun story, actually. Um, K-pop was really small in the Netherlands back then. And um, I was just Googling for like K-pop parties in the area uh, yeah and uh and found a found a small k-pop party um in a in a bar in rotterdam so i went there and just started asking around like do you know anybody who you know was interested in writing k-pop music and uh, i found this guy who was organizing the uh the party actually and he's like yeah man i really want to do that i studied songwriting as well and i you know i want to get into this this is my passion so I found him and another guy, and then we just started writing a song every week. So we did a full song on Monday. We would write everything. Monday evening, we would record everything. And then throughout the week, we would 
uh, produce everything and mix it all and have a song finished. And we did that for a year or so. And then we had our first K-pop placement. And you got together in, in an actual room. To yeah, do a, a much smaller room than this one. It was uh, like two by three or so, like a really small room. <laughs> wow oh that meters that is yeah so, yeah but a really small room <laughs> everybody who's american is going they did it in a closet okay it's, yeah it, it was a closet literally <laughs> you're like the harry potter of k-pop yeah. <laughs> little space under the stairs um so you were learning and he was learning uh how did you get good during that process because usually you know people try to write up which in Nashville lingo means that you find somebody who's a little further down the road than you are right and, and you learn from the skills they already have in this case you were both finding your way how did that work out I guess it was I mean we knew how to make music um uh, he studied some I was doing my instrumentals um and we just really focused on quality we knew the bar was super high so just focusing on getting the best song you can make that week um and you know making really long hours those mondays were mostly like 14 hours or so of writing and recording and then um <coughs> yeah just focusing on that and then obviously really this is probably going to be a question among many people listening like okay so how do you get your first placement like how do you get your first uh publisher right and um that was just a case of googling publishers um our first publisher was from Stockholm you know the pop capital of uh of Europe I guess um and it was just a matter of sending out our demos and eventually actually the first demo that I got in with was was with a taxi member the girl from uh, LA who but anyway we got into that publisher and um and he was like yeah I think I can work with this it will take some time before you get your first placement, but just keep keep on writing. I will critique a little bit and um, and we'll see. Um, he didn't really cr critique much, but just like every now and then he was like, yeah, this is really good. Keep working on this. Obviously, we would get briefs. That was really important as well, uh, having that publisher as a contact. And um, uh, and then, list, then every time a brief would come out, a couple of months later, the song would come out right the single and it was like hey this is probably from that breathe right, right. <laughs> so we'd start linking that and then listen to our own song and we're like okay i understand why they chose that one most of the time ah. sometimes you're we like maybe ours was better <laughs> it's but, very um, much like taxi members going to the forwards blog and listening to the definitely. stuff that forward people either learn from it or they go i think mine was better <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and just being honest really like a, a really good trick for me is have imagining Max Martin is standing right next to you <laughs> and showing showing him the song and right. feeling wherever you feel a bit ashamed or a bit you know not a hundred percent happy with what you made um that's that was that's a really good trick <laughs> also a very good test for deodorant <laughs> if you were uh, <laughs> sitting next to Max Martin while listening to your music yeah. <laughs> like crazy yeah I remember once sitting in an a &R office, probably back in the early 80s, and I remember when I was playing something that I produced for an a &R person, and it sounded slow, it sounded pitchy, it just like everything that could be wrong was happening in my brain while he was listening. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, yeah. Well, at the time, so K-pop, somebody once told me this and honestly i'm not knowledgeable enough about the genre I, i've heard k-pop uh obviously but somebody said to me it's just american pop with, with korean lyrics over it um to some extent i think that's true but give us the finer points about what makes k-pop different than american mm -hmm. top 40 pop yeah no it's definitely not just american pop uh i don't agree with that um i think it's really important to study your genres, study genres you're working on. Um, that started even when I was doing the future base uh, EDM uh, cues, like just listening to it's it, it, Spotify makes it so easy, you know, just listen to a, yeah. uh, a, a playlist. Um, so I just have the K-pop playlist or the K-pop top 
whatever on my uh on my iphone all the time and i listen to it and no it's definitely not like american music um harmonics are way more important obviously often it's really big groups so yeah making our demos um we always have to try to even though we have one vocalist we always try to make that vocalist sound like different persons throughout the song right um there is something that i'd like to call the key the k-pop pre-chorus they're most of the time they are like really big and really quite long and building different chords than the verse and the chorus uh which is you know in american pop most of the time it's the same chords all the time mm -hmm. actually at the moment that's changing again but um and then just the eclecticism you know the fact that the verse can be pure hip-hop like hard hip-hop and then the pre-chorus can sound like a like a ballad really and then back to hip-hop in the chorus so that would not really happen in uh in american pop music so there there are definitely differences can you lay out the structure like you know an american pop it would be intro verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus and out how is it different in k-pop structure just like that but pre-choruses are important okay and, and then yeah. sometimes a bridge would be a combination of a bridge and uh like a dance break so dance obviously is really important in uh in k-pop um both in the live versions and in the videos right so a dance break can just be like eight bars of really hard um with 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 lots of hits and stuff and lots of feels so there can be a cool dance on that and then back into the last chorus so what was harder to learn the production style or being able to write lyrics for i'm guessing most of the artists are, are much younger than you um and they're singing about uh things that you would probably have to go back in your memory it's like meeting a girl for the first time at 18 years old or something i don't know you know it's all all the k-pop i've heard has been very relationship uh love relationship based um what what was harder learning how to write lyrics or building the tracks well to be honest the lyrics aren't very important um because they're gonna change them anyway they're gonna so as uh they they have they send out briefs for the songs and then as soon as they pick the song they will send out another uh brief for uh -huh. lyrics for that song within korea so then a bunch of songwriters, lyricists in Korea will send their lyrics and then they'll choose the, the one they like best. And so they um, become your co-writer. So you have a co-writer on building the track and then you get another co-writer who's the lyricist. Yeah, and we will not meet them most of the time. Interesting. But, yeah. Um, aren't you ever curious to want to meet them and sit down and like do a session with them and see what would, you know, if you'd have some sort of, I yeah, mean, whenever we, whenever I go to Seoul, I meet oh, people. Sorry. Also, in COVID. yeah. <laughs> also, Instagram is uh, my most important uh, tool. So uh, I I'm, I meet them on Instagram, and it's like, hey, congrats, so cool, we did this song together, you know. <laughs> um, but no, I, I'm I'm saying it's not important. I mean, it's not as important as I when when I'd be writing for America. But still, it has to be cool. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and to be honest, in sessions, we like to get quite naughty when writing the lyrics because we yeah. feel like it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Most of them won't understand it. So it's like pretty dirty lyrics. That's um, funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's just having fun with the writing process as well. Uh, <laughs> and entertain, it gives you uh, the, the entertainment of writing dirty lyrics gives you the adrenaline to go 14 hours in a session. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get it. Um, let's see what else. Uh, oh, let's talk about the East Asian market. Um, I, I would say the vast majority of us in America know very little about it unless they're already working in that market. It's hard to learn about. You were extremely smart to just go find a club, walk in and just, you know, almost like you would do at the road rally, just walk around and network until you got to the right guy on your first try, no less. It worked so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. Crazy. Or um, yeah, interesting. Oh, how do you, I mean, have you had to learn how to speak Korean? Are there any customs that you've had to learn? when you meet people customs, yes. them, yeah tell me about it 
Yeah. Um, well, as much as I have to adapt a little bit uh, when I'm going to America, because our cultures are different, I also have to uh, adapt myself a little bit when I'm in Seoul. Um, working hours in Seoul, for example, are crazy. Like people work so hard in Korea. Um, and um, and then for working hours within the music industry, most of the time it starts around 1 p.m. or 3 p.m. And then you go all the way through the night till 6 a.m. or so. So crazy hours. Um, you know, you got to show that you're willing to work really hard. Um, that's really important. Uh, always be super friendly and humble. Um, and that's quite hard for a dutchie. So uh, that was something I had to learn. <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, we're like one of the most direct people you can ever meet. We'll we'll tell you something if if we don't like the sound of something or whatever. I'll remember but, that um, at, the, at the end of every road rally when people from uh, Amsterdam come up to me and say, well, the road rally is really good, but I don't like the way you moderate. I'll just have to say, well, <laughs> I understand you're from the Netherlands. It's cool. <laughs> right but if you don't know that um <laughs> now i do <laughs> and then yeah uh parties uh there's a big drinking culture in in seoul so uh after work there's often like after work drinks and often with food so meeting people over food is important you know this i guess just more of an asian thing um so those uh those apply as well um and then the yeah just the quality bar in in korea is just so high the standard is so high like your your productions have to be really really good to be able to uh to uh to have a chance and how and that's really different in japan for example the that bar was is going to be one of my japan. questions later was what's the difference between j-pop and k-pop because if you go to almost any sushi restaurant they also have Korean dishes on the menu, and the same is true for Korean. So I've always assumed that because the two countries are close, there's a lot of intermarriage between the two cultures, that there would be um, musical crosstalk as well, but not apparently. Well, there definitely is, but um, J-pop is just less good, I'd say. Um, it's also the business is more hierarchical, so there's a lot of old people still doing the work still getting the, the big jobs. So to be fair, to be honest, sometimes we would send our, our demos and yeah. then they would record it with the artist and we would feel like, you know, our vocal production would be so much better than their vocal production. Wow. And then when we would talk about that they, uh, with uh, people from Japan, they're like, yeah, it's just the older people still getting the jobs. Um, so that's sometimes hard, but you know, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's just the reality. Um, and then China is another market. And so often it's like when a song doesn't sell in Korea, we're going to try to sell it in Japan. And then if it doesn't sell in Japan, then we're going to try to sell it in, in China. So wow. that's kind of uh, the order. Yeah. <laughs> so what do they call it in China? Like C-pop? C-pop, yeah. yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and then and... also harmonically, it's really different in, um, in, uh, in Japan. So I don't know if you know about Ghibli, the Ghibli m movies. No our neighbor Totoro and all those movies from uh that it's all anime from uh from Japan and there's a lot of piano music from Japan Man, look at me I'm old <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I don't watch anime. <laughs> and when you were talking about the old guys working on the records how old are you talking about <laughs> just older thank you. um but um um yeah no actually that they started in the 90s or 80s even ghibli it's a big uh, yeah it's um it, it's kind of a thing from japan but a lot of people like listening to that to the soundtracks from ghibli and if you want to learn about harm uh the harmonics or the harmonical structure in j-pop then you can definitely start with listening to um piano music and orchestral music in uh in those in those movies in J in japanese movies ah. Yeah. So when you're talking about the harmonic structure, are you talking about the intervals of, of melody and everything um, as it relates to the track? Or are you talking more about um, harmonic structure in the vocal stack? In, um, mostly in just the type of chord progressions that it would use. For example, one, one that's really uh, Japanese is like going from C to E major and then A minor. Okay. Yeah, so that's just... 
and then th they will start with it often. <laughs> those kind of melodies yeah okay so definitely uh, different types of um of progressions um and what would differentiate the harmonic structure of a k-pop single versus an american pop single are there any you know instantly noticeable differences um the dif the difference used to be bigger three or four years ago when all almost all american hits were one progression mm. that's changing now um, yeah. like ever since olivia rodrigo had a huge hit and yeah now it's more pop songs again instead of uh, more hip-hop songs um but yeah so then it was a huge difference because the pre-chorus would always be a different progression in uh, in k-pop um bridge as well and then the bridge often is quite r and uh, R&B style yeah. in terms of progressions. So more extensions, more jazzy chords and that kind of stuff. And do they plug in the artists? I mean, do they assemble K-pop boy bands, um, you know, like they did in the 80s with American boy, American boy bands where they would look for voices, personalities, and almost like, typecasting them with you know almost like actors and Definitely. then plug that into the track so you're not really writing for well i guess let me restructure my question um when it's a new artist that hasn't been defined yet um do they hear a song that they like from you or another writer producer and go that's the style we're looking for that works really well for the band that we're building you know the 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 types of boys in this band and and then your sound kind of becomes their trademark throughout their career i i there might be a little bit of that but i feel like most of the time it's even more planned out so they know what type of uh tracks they want to release with uh, they want they know what type of album uh, songs they want to release with and um and so they just know we're we're looking for this kind of song make us something that sounds like that and then they'll choose the best one and how many submissions do you think they get um because obviously they're reaching out to pro writers who've been tested already yeah um, and i mean do you think it's like 20 or 50 or a thousand i would say 100 or so okay and curious because you know uh, and then there has been a filter at the publishers as well course right yeah i don't know i really don't know never but i feel like it should be something like that because i just keep meeting people who write for k-pop <laughs> yeah I mean, back in when faith hill was at the peak of her career um i was told by a reliable source in nashville that whatever the current album was that just came out that they listened over five thousand songs before they picked the 12 that went on that record wow Wow. Yeah. That's between, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Between the man, well, taxi, you know, uh, yeah, you guys are filters. We're used to well, work yeah. digging numbers like yeah. 5,000 is nothing for us. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you consider that managers probably bring in stuff, producers bring in stuff, AR people bring in stuff, band members bring in stuff from friends, however else it gets there. Yeah. I, I think you're right. It's got to be easily hundreds, plural, and then it gets filtered down to, 100 probably and then 50 and then yeah yeah um so does your door get knocked on figuratively speaking uh fairly often now are you like a mainstream k-pop writer that everybody in that industry knows and are you mm, a, a little bit like yeah. i feel like we're kind of like the the dutch guys <laughs> That's okay like, just just like they would say the sweets you know <laughs> yeah um because before us there there had only been um uh, one producer couple who has had one really big hit but that was like 15 years ago or so or yeah you know, 10 or 15 years ago so um and then at the moment i'm working with a publishing company in seoul so and that's that one is quite famous at the moment yeah so at least they they know how to reach them uh that publishing company and then i'm just one of the writers there 
After we're done with the interview, I want to um, see if you know an old friend of mine who was also a taxi member, probably a little bit before you were. Um, I was hooking him up on um, instrumental cue stuff and scoring stuff, uh, and, but his real job was being a, a K-pop uh, producer, and I believe he split his time between Los Angeles and Singapore, oddly enough. Um, and I wonder if you guys have ever crossed paths. If you haven't, maybe I should introduce you because he's a really good guy and extremely talented. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, that's Jack. Yeah, very, very likable guy. <clears throat> um, I, I, I took him to Universal Pictures to the head of music supervision at Universal Pictures and called this guy up and said, I think I've just found the next great composer. And nice. he, chuckled. he goes, yeah, uh -huh, sure bring them on over. So he said, but before you bring them over, tell them to pick two scenes from movies that I've worked on and, uh, and, and rescore those scenes. And he listened to the guy's stuff and went, wow, you were better than, you know, this composer in that film. And um, I think one of them was actually Hans Zimmer. He said, you actually did a little better than Hans did on that scene. And they well, that's looked quite at a me compliment. Said, yeah, it was. He looked at me and he said, Michael, tell them why we can't use them. <laughs> I went, uh, thanks, Harry. Um, let's see, you can't use them because they just invested $80 million to make the movie and they don't want to go with an unknown composer, even though you're remarkably talented. And he went, oh, man, that's so yep. hard. Yeah. 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 Anyway. That um, happens sometimes in, uh, in, in the K-pop industry as well, um, where it's just like, um, it's such a big new group it's such, from such a big um uh company and they just need to be 100 percent sure that it's going to be a hit that i feel like that happens in every industry yeah don't you think yeah go with what's tried and true if you're putting yeah. your money down on, on you know on the bet you want to eliminate any possible any point of failure that you can but it just shows that people who work in the industry that make those decisions don't trust their own ears <laughs> Yeah, or they're scared of their um, supervisors as well. Yeah, of their own supervisors. Absolutely. 